Hi there. Can everybody hear me? Yes. My name is Tony Lopresti, and I am part of the Department of Religious and Theological Studies. On behalf of my colleagues in RTS, as well as our co-sponsors in the English Department, American Studies, the Mercy Center, Academic Affairs, and Mission Integration, I would like to welcome you to tonight's presentation by John Allen, the prize-winning senior correspondent for the National Catholic Reporter and the senior Vatican analyst for CNN. Seven and a half months ago, most of the world was surprised when Cardinal Bergoglio of Buenos Aires was elected the 266th Pope of the Roman Catholic Church. Since then, I think it is fair to say that Pope Francis has surprised, even shocked millions by the way he has exercised his office. It is not often that a man who, has, who was relatively unknown when he was 60 years old rises later to the pinnacle of fame. That's the opening sentence of an article in the New York Times titled, Papal Innovator. And I am sure there are many people who would agree that Pope Francis is, at least in style, if not in substance, leading the church in innovative ways. <coughs> that New York Times article, however, was not published recently. It actually goes back 51 years and refers to blessed Pope John XXIII, the Pope who is best remembered for invoking the Second Vatican Council, a gathering which forever changed the face of the Catholic Church presented to the world. Some today are wondering whether Pope Francis will unleash a similar revolution, whether the path he is forging will continue to surprise the world, or whether in the end it's a, tall, it's a too tall task to expect one man to transform a church with 1.2 billion members and an entrenched bureaucracy that, like all bureaucracies, resists change. Tonight's speaker is well qualified to address the issues at hand. John Allen is widely respected around the world by his fellow journalists and by thousands of readers, by those who would like to see change in the church and those who are comfortable with the way things have been. In addition to his work for the National Catholic Reporter and CNN, John has published, by my count, at least nine books, including two this year. Needless to say, his output is prolific. <coughs> I have read his columns regularly for at least the last 10 years, and I can vouch that the quality of his work is on a par with the quantity. The title of John's talk this evening is Behind the Headlines, Pope Francis and His New Vision for the Catholic Church. Please welcome John Warner. Thank you, Tony. <clears throat> Hello there. Hi there. Can everyone hear? Yes. Outstanding. Well, listen, you've brought me in tonight as what the Italians would call a Vaticanista, that is, a professional expert on the goings on of the Vatican and the papacy. So I suppose the obligatory thing is to begin by establishing my bona fides, the, that is, my credentials to pontificate about so lofty a subject as Francis and the destiny of the Catholic Church. So let me begin just by telling you a, a brief word about what I do for a living. Uh, I lived in Rome full-time for 10 years. Now I spend about a third of every year in Rome, and so when I'm in Rome, what I'm doing is going in and out of offices of the Roman Curia, that's the central administrative bureaucracy of the Vatican, to try to figure out you know, what's going on there. Although, if you want a, a dirty little secret of my profession, the truth of it is that very little information collection goes on in these formal meetings in Vatican offices. They're more akin to courtesy calls. If you want to know where we actually find out what's going on in Rome, it is, of course, over lengthy Italian lunches and dinners. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, I am aware that it is a real burden of my office that so much of it is done over Italian meals, but I want you to know that I am over there carrying the cross for all of you. Okay. Now, as a Vaticanista, I also move when the Pope moves. So uh, under John Paul, he of course took a historic 104 foreign trips. I covered about 60 of them. Uh, I covered all 18 of Benedict XVI's foreign trips, and I've covered Francis's one foreign trip to Brazil. 
Uh, and the story I want to tell you, uh, just to sort of solidify my status to comment in this sort of thing, is, is situated on one of those foreign trips. Uh, this is John Paul's 2002 trip to Azerbaijan. Now, I, I don't know if you know this, but when the Holy Father travels, he does so in a sort of unique dual capacity. Uh, the Pope is both a, a head of state, because the Holy See is a, foreign, is a sovereign entity under international law. It exchanges ambassadors with about 109 countries. Uh, and so when he arrives in a foreign country, he, is, he was always welcomed twice, once in a very formal diplomatic setting, uh, and then uh, second, in a kind of informal setting on behalf of the local Catholic population. And that second uh, greeting uh, is usually done by, say, the bishop of the local diocese, or the president of the bishop's conference, or, you know, the primate, if it's one of those Catholic countries that has a traditional primate or whatever. But if it's a very small Catholic country that does not have its own bishops, then that greeting will be done by the Pope's nuncio. That's his ambassador in that country, who by tradition holds the rank of archbishop. Now, Azerbaijan was such a case. As of 2002, ladies and gentlemen, there were a grand total of 114 Catholics in Azerbaijan. I actually did the math. It would have been four times less expensive to fly all of them to Rome. <laughs> <laughs> than to bring the Pope, but that of course wasn't the point. Uh, and on, on this occasion, therefore there were no bishops in Azerbaijan, so on this occasion, the welcome for the Holy Father was done by the papal nuncio, who at the time was a very kindly, elderly Italian monsignore. Uh, a very salt of the earth guy, I mean, loved by the people, wonderful man, uh, since gone to his reward. But he had a reputation, and I am here to tell you folks, it was a well-deserved reputation, as a bit of a windbag, okay? <laughs> that is, he had that remarkable Italian oratorical capacity just to go on and on and on, and the miracle of it is, without ever saying anything. <laughs> you know, Tony invoked the memory of John the 23rd. John the 23rd, famously, was once told by a member of his own curia that he talked a lot, to which his response was, yes, yes, I talk a lot, but I don't say anything. <laughs> well, that's this Monsignore, okay? So on, on this occasion, I actually clocked his greeting, folks. It was 40 minutes. And bear in mind, this was a 24-hour trip. We thought John Paul would be back in Rome before this guy was done welcoming him to Baku, you know? So anyway, uh, I was at that greeting uh, in the press pool. We were at the end of one row of seats, and then there was a very narrow aisle. Okay, and so right across the aisle was the Vatican Seguito, that's the, like the entourage, the, the cardinals and other senior officials who travel with the Pope. So I was more or less, I was at the end of the row, I was more or less cheek by jowl with a very senior Vatican cardinal, a guy I know very well, I've interviewed him many times over the years, and I could tell as this welcome was winding on and on, this cardinal was becoming increasingly frustrated. Right? You can tell these things, right? Because his breathing was becoming more labored and <laughs> veins were throbbing on his forehead and so on. And so at one stage, I thought the guy was going to burst. And so I, I leaned across the aisle and I said, Cardinal, what do you think? Okay. Now, there was this nanosecond of calculation. You could tell he was thinking, should I say this? Should I not say it? But it was obvious he needed to get this off his chest. So. He leaned across the aisle, and looking up at this Italian Monsignore going on and on and saying nothing, okay, the Cardinal whispered to me in sotto voce fashion, you realize that some Italian village is missing its idiot. <laughs> True story. Now. In addition to being a true story, and in, in addition to being a once-on-a-career punchline, uh, it, I think it also makes a valuable point. And the valuable point it makes uh, is that only from afar could the Vatican look like a kind of Stepford Wives environment in which everyone thinks alike and talks alike and dresses alike and acts alike. When you see it on an up-close and personal basis, what reveals itself is its complexity. What you learn is that there is a wide variety of temperaments and personalities and outlooks and hopes and dreams uh, in that place. And so what you get is this capacity 
to see the shades of gray in between the black and the white. And I hope it's that same capacity to see the gray in between the black and the white that I can bring to you tonight when we talk about Pope Francis and, and what, what he means uh, for the Catholic future. Now, I'm sure you would all agree with me that what we have seen over the last almost eight months since the election of Pope Francis on March 13th, 2013, is nothing short of a tsunami, a tsunami uh, in Catholic life uh, that is promises to leave no zone of church life untouched. Uh, and so let me give you my game plan to try to unpack this tsunami for you a little bit tonight. My game plan is I'm going to first say a couple of words about the Francis effect, that is the way in which this new pope has sort of taken the world by storm uh, in his opening act. Then I'm going to spend most of my time trying to unpack for you what I see as three emerging pillars to Francis's papacy, the kind of cornerstones uh, of what he's about and, and where his uh, impact is likely to be the greatest. Uh, I'll then say a few words about blowback, uh, that is, some emerging centers of ambivalence and concern uh, that we're seeing uh, with regard to the new pope. I'll end with a final thought about how we react to all of this, uh, and then it'll be your turn. Then we'll go to Q&A and, and see where you want to take the conversation, okay? So first, some quick thoughts about the Francis effect. That is, the way in which this pope has kind of, you know, uh, emerged on the world stage and, and grabbed people by the scruff of the neck and sort of forced them to pay attention to the papacy in a new way. Uh, and I'll, I'll break this down in terms of three points. One, his popular appeal. Second, his media appeal. And then third, his impact on the culture in Rome. Okay, let's start with his popular appeal. Lots of stuff we could say about this. For example, do you know that three days ago, Pope Francis broke the 10 million mark for his following on Twitter? Uh, he is now the most followed religious figure uh, on the planet on Twitter, though not the most popular figure of all on Twitter. Do you all know who the most followed single person on Twitter is? Yeah, Justin, Bieber. Justin Bieber, thank you. <laughs> and surely the apocalypse cannot be far behind. <laughs> but, uh, but he is a phenomenon. Or we could talk about Francis's poll numbers. You probably know that Francis, in every part of the world, where public opinion can be scientifically measured, Francis has approval ratings that celebrities and politicians would sacrifice their children to Moloch to acquire. I mean, for example, in the United States, there are two polls the, uh, recently, the Quinnipiac College and uh, the Pew Forum, that found that only 4%, that's 4, 4% of American Catholics disapprove of the job the new pope is doing which basically means that 96% of American Catholics like the Pope. Now, think about what we in this room all know about how badly divided the Catholic Church in the United States is on most things. I mean, the truth of it is, under ordinary circumstances, it would be tough to get 96% of us to agree that today is Tuesday, okay? <laughs> Under those circumstances, the fact that the Pope has a 96% thumbs up rating from American Catholics is remarkable. And frankly, I think if we ever get around to beatifying this guy, this could count as the first miracle in that process. Okay. <laughs> Stunning. But that's not what I want to point out in terms of his, his popular appeal. What I want to talk about is his trip to Brazil in July. Uh, you probably know that Francis went to Brazil to celebrate World Youth Day in July. Now, I was on that trip. I was on the papal plane covering it. Uh, one thing is, you know that at the end of that trip, he drew three million, more than three million people to Rio de Janeiro's Copacabana Beach twice. Okay? One was Saturday night for the youth vigil as part of World Youth Day, and the second was the concluding mass on Sunday morning. By the way, shattering the previous uh, attendance record at Copa, which was held by the Rolling Stones. And let me tell you that if you can go on American television and craft sentences that have both the Pope and Mick Jagger in them, you were really on to something. Okay? But that's not even the, the point I want to make. The point I want to make is it came on Thursday uh, of that week. Uh, on that day, Francis went downtown in Rio to the Basilica, the cathedral where he was going to meet a delegation of Argentinian youth who were there. Uh, but of course, you know, when word got out that the Pope was going, everybody else showed up too. So when we pulled up to the, the cathedral, 
uh, the, the, the Pope mobile was in the front of the motorcade, the press bus was like two vehicles back. But anyway, we, we pulled into this, this area around the cathedral that was supposed to be cordoned off, okay? So it was supposed to be, you know, the people were supposed to have been kept away from this space. But uh, there was a group of Latin American nuns that had somehow wormed their way uh, into this space. <laughs> And so when the Pope Mobile pulled up, the, the door opens, Francis steps out. These nuns rush him, screaming like teenage girls at a Justin Bieber concert. Okay, it was just unbelievable. And I'm watching all this happen. And, and you know, the Brazilians had theoretically uh, delegated 20,000, you know, military and police to provide security at this thing, who were supposed to prevent this kind of thing from happening. So I pulled one of these guys aside and I said, what's going on? Why, why didn't you, you know, get in the way? And this guy looks at me and he says, look at me, man. I've got a combat helmet on. I'm wearing ammo stripped across my, sh my chest. I am not going to be the guy caught on YouTube beating up a nun. Okay? <laughs> Just not going to happen, you know? That was the temper of those days, okay? There, there is something about this man that, that kind of elicits a, a fervor that, uh, that is just quite singular. All right, that's his popular appeal. Quick word about his media appeal. Again, a lot of things we could talk about here. But let me give you my favorite example of the kind of cachet that Francis enjoys now in the global media. Do you all know that in June, the Italian edition of Vanity Fair magazine now, stop for a minute. Vanity Fair magazine, okay? This is not exactly a diocesan newspaper out there someplace, okay? Vanity Fair magazine declared Pope Francis its man of the year, okay? Including a tribute from that, you know, well-known Vaticanologist Elton John, okay? Elton John, who described Francis as an island of humility in a sea of vanity, okay? Now, think about this, you know, this is June we're talking about. The Italian edition of Vatican Fair typically brings out its Man of the Year issue in December at the end of the year, but they had decided by June that nothing anyone could do for the next six months would possibly exceed. This is like an American Little League baseball game where one team is ahead by 10 runs and we're worried about embarrassing the opposition, so we call the game. That's essentially what Vanity Fair did. They decided that by June, it was already clear that nobody was going to surpass what they had seen from Pope Francis during that period of time. Uh, and of course, he had only been Pope for about two months uh, at that stage. Uh, there is a kind of romance uh, between the global media and Pope Francis that, uh, that, that is going on that, that that particular decision illustrates. All right, that's the media appeal. Finally, quick word about his impact on the culture in Rome. Okay. Again, many things I could tell you to illustrate this point, but let me give you my favorite uh, example. As I said, Francis was elected on March 13th. I was shackled to a CNN set basically for the rest of March. In April, once I finally liberated myself uh, from those obligations, uh, I went down to uh, Argentina to spend most of April in Argentina trying to do the backstory and who Jorge Mario Bergoglio was. And then I came back to Rome. So we're now talking late April, and uh, I was, one day, uh, I was down in the Roman neighborhood of Trastevere, uh, and in Trastevere, which is kind of like now the Georgetown of Rome, it's a kind of a chic neighborhood, but there, there's a sort of satellite Vatican down there, and many of the pontifical councils have their headquarters there. So I was out to dinner with a couple of friends of mine who come from the pontifical council for the family, and we were at this eatery that a lot of Vatican personnel go to. So we're at this dinner table, and we're having a conversation. And at one stage, this Vatican, very well-known Vatican cardinal walks into the restaurant. This is a guy who has been around for a long time, ladies and gentlemen. I actually, I have not done the check, but I think if I did, I would probably find that this guy got his red hat from Pius XI, okay? <laughs> how long he's been around. And normally he looks the part, you know? I mean, normally he's vested in the standard kind of ecclesiastical finery. But this particular night, when he walked into the restaurant, he was just wearing the simple black clergyman, you know, the Roman collar and the petrol cross, and that was it, right? Uh, and so when he, and he was doing the standard thing that Italian cardinals do, which is going around all the dinner, the, the, all the tables in the restaurant saying hello to everybody. So when he came over to our table, 
uh, I sort of joking, I've known him a long time, I sort of jokingly said to him, hey, what's up with, you know, the way you're, you're dressed tonight? I mean, it's just, you know, it's, it's not the normal thing. And he looked at me and he gave me a line that I think probably ought to be printed on t-shirts, okay, as the epigrammatic synthesis of the, Vat or the Francis impact in Rome. He looked at me and he said, John, what you must understand is that with this pope, simple is the new chic. Okay. So that's the Francis impact on Rome. Uh, I mean, we could go on. The point simply is that his impact on the global media culture, on kind of popular culture, and even on ecclesiastical culture has been remarkable uh, during the opening days of his papacy. But the question, obviously, is, you know, Francis does not see himself just as a celebrity or, or just as somebody who is acquiring followers on Twitter. I mean, he sees himself as somebody who is trying to sort of reorient the church in his time. So the, the substantive question is, what are the pillars of this papacy, the areas in which the Pope sees as his own greatest priorities and therefore where his personal impact is likely to be the greatest as things unfold? So what I want to do is try to sketch for you what I would see as three pillars of the Francis era, that is, the three areas in which the Pope seems to be focusing his greatest energies and, and therefore where the kind of fallout from the Francis Revolution is likely to be the most palpable, okay? And those three areas are leadership as service, the social gospel, and mercy as the core spiritual message, okay? And let me unpack each in turn. First, leadership as service. Of course, we all know, uh, to a great extent, what has caused the world to be so fascinated with this pope are the kind of splashes of humility and simplicity we've seen from him over these eight months. Beginning with that moment when he stepped out onto the balcony of St. Peter's Square, and before he gave the customary papal blessing, he said, first, I want to kneel in prayer and ask you to pray for me before I pray for you. Uh, the fact that he has so repeatedly referred to himself not as Supreme Pontiff, but as the Bishop of Rome. Uh, the fact that he has chosen to live in room 201 of the Casa Santa Marta uh, rather than the papal apartment. Uh, the fact that he has not put on the, the kind of you know, red shoes that we typically associate with the papacy, but he's still wearing the same brown shoes that he carried with him to Rome from, uh, from Buenos Aires, and on and on. The, the, the fact that he has kind of spurned the, the, the chauffeur-driven limousine and prefers to take simpler modes of transportation and all of that. Now, you know, to some extent, that all arises from the personality of Jorge Mario Bergoglio. Uh, I mean, you, you may know that when he was the Archbishop of Buenos Aires, one of the things he did was, rather than living in the somewhat elegant Archbishop's residence in Buenos Aires, he sort of turned that into a meeting and conference center, and he himself lived in a very Spartan apartment uh, in downtown Buenos Aires. I visited it. It's the kind of place where on the weekends he had to leave his stove on all day Saturday and Sunday because there was no heating in this building, and when it gets cold in Argentina, it was the only way to, get to, to take the chill off. Okay, so part of it comes out of his personality, but I think the larger issue here is that this pope is trying to create a new standard, a new model for what leadership in the church looks like. Uh, and he, he hasn't articulated that only through gestures. He has also articulated that verbally. On June 22nd, he had a meeting with all of the nuncios of the world, that is the papal ambassadors around the world, who typically play the reed role in choosing new bishops. And he laid out his vision of what leadership in the church is supposed to look like. Uh, and what he said is that what he wants is bishops who reject what he described as the psychology of a prince. And instead, he said, he wants leaders who have, he said he wants pastors who have the smell of their sheep because they are close to the ordinary people that they are called to serve. Okay, that's his model. And although on that occasion, he was talking about bishops. I think this vision applies more broadly to everyone who plays a leadership role in the church. Okay? And I, I think fundamentally what is going on here is that Francis, his vision is that he wants people to recalibrate their impressions of what leadership in the church looks like. 
That is, when people look at church leaders, when they look at someone who was wearing a, a pectoral cross or a Roman collar or somebody who, who holds office in the Catholic Church, he wants them not to think automatically of power and privilege and systems of control, but rather he wants people to, when they see those symbols of office, he wants them to think of fidelity to the gospel. Okay, that's what he wants, the kind of instinctive response, the kind of popular culture take uh, on what leadership in Catholicism looks like. That's what he wants. And by the way, we now have proof that he is actually prepared to back that vision up uh, with using the, the powers of his office when push comes to shove. Uh, and this proof comes to us from the Diocese of Limburg in Germany. You all know the story of the so-called Bling Bishop in Limburg? If you haven't heard this, uh, this is Bishop Franz Peter Tabarts von Elst, which, I mean, just saying that sounds aristocratic, doesn't it? Although the truth is, he comes from a family of poor farmers in Bavaria, but, but I mean, nevertheless, the name just sort of is evocative. Anyway, uh, Bishop Tabarts von Elst uh, recently uh, sort of attracted some global infamy uh, because he launched a remodeling project for the, uh, the, his own residence in the diocesan center in Limburg, which was originally projected at $5 million and in the end ran to about $42 million, uh, including famously $1.1 million for landscaping his garden and probably most famously $22,000 for a new bathtub. Okay? Good work if you can get it. Okay, it would, would be one way of summing it all up. Uh, bishop, all of that, uh, of course, made the bishop a subject of controversy in Germany and beyond. Uh, pope Francis dispatched a, an investigator in September, an Italian cardinal by the name of Giovanni Laiolo, who used to be the Vatican's foreign minister uh, and then was president of the Vatican City State. Cardinal Laiolo went into Limburg in September, looked into the situation, found that the numbers were basically as they had been reported in the media. Uh, in October, uh, this bishop, Tebarts von Elst, and the president of the German Bishops Conference were called to Rome for meetings with the Pope. And on the back of all of that, Pope Francis decided that uh, this bishop would be basically given a sabbatical outside of the diocese. He's appointed a new administrator for the diocese. This new administrator's first job uh, is to, uh, to, to whatever extent he can, try to dial back the expenditures uh, on this remodeling project. At the moment, the hypothesis is that this newly remodeled diocesan center and residence will no longer be the bishop's private residence. It's going to be turned into either a refugee center or a soup kitchen. That's the idea. Uh, and this bishop, who is, by the way, uh, just 53, he won't be 54 until the 20th of November, he, in the meantime, has been given some time to go off to a Benedictine monastery in Bavaria, sort of collect himself, uh, and the idea is then he will come back into some other leadership role in the church. Uh, it is a kind of soft landing that Francis has engineered, but nevertheless, the papal disapproval of the decisions that were made in Limburg is unmistakable, uh, and it's a kind of shot across the bow uh, to leaders of all stripes in the church that this kind of lavish expenditure is just simply not in keeping with the tone the new pope is setting. Okay? All right, so that's leadership as service. Second, the social gospel. You probably know that Francis has given three blockbuster interviews since his election on March 13th. The first was an hour and 20 minute, no holds barred, nothing off the table press conference that he gave to those of us who were covering the trip to Brazil on the flight from Rio back to Rome. Uh, here's what I usually say about that flight. What I say uh, is that Alitalia flight 4001 from Rio de Janeiro to Rome on July 28th in many ways was nothing to write home about. The seats were uncomfortable, the food was mediocre, but ladies and gentlemen, the in-flight entertainment was spectacular. <laughs> okay, because what the Pope did is he came back to the press compartment and simply said, what do you got? And for an hour and 20 minutes took every question under the sun. So that was number one. Number two was the interview he gave to 16 Jesuit publications around the world uh, in September, uh, which was conducted by the editor of Civilità Cattolica, the Jesuit uh, edited monthly in Rome, uh, Father uh, Antonio Spadaro, uh, in September. 
Uh, and then an interview with a leftist, non-believing Italian journalist by the name of Eugenio Scalfari uh, in early October. On two of those occasions, that is, his interview uh, with, uh, with us on the plane and the interview with the Jesuits, the Pope has said that he does not believe it is essential for the Pope to talk repeatedly uh, about issues such as abortion, gay marriage, and contraception, not because those issues aren't important, but because the Church's teaching is already well known uh, and that he believes it's important to talk about other issues. Now, those comments from the Pope have sometimes been misunderstood. I think there are some who believe they signal a kind of retreat from the pro-life advocacy of the Church. I don't think that's the case. If you look at that Jesuit interview, it appeared on the 15th of September. On the 16th of September, the Pope gave an address to a group of Catholic physicians in Rome, which is one of the strongest pro-life speeches you will ever see from the Bishop of Rome, in which he defined the right to life as the primordial and foundational right of all of the others. So I don't think it signals a retreat from the Church's pro-life advocacy, but what I do think it signals is a desire on the part of Francis to lift up the other elements of Catholic social teaching to a level of kind of rough equality with the time and treasure that we have invested over the last 35 years uh, in defending the culture of life. Uh, so things like solidarity with the poor, uh, opposition to war and the promotion of peace, uh, environmental concern, race relations, those sorts of things. Uh, what, we, what we often think of as the social gospel, I think those will likely be the most incisive and forceful areas where this pope applies the, 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 the sort of bully pulpit that he enjoys to issues of faith and politics. Uh, and I think it is no surprise, therefore, in, in light of that big picture, it is no surprise that the three gutsiest political interventions that we have seen from Francis so far over these first eight months have all come roughly in the area of the social gospel. And those were uh, his July 8th trip to Lampedusa, his July 24th visit to a favela in Rio, uh, and his September 7th uh, intervention against the idea of Western military strikes in Syria. Quick word about each. July 8th, Lampedusa. His first trip outside Rome actually wasn't to Brazil. That was his first foreign trip. But his first trip in Italy outside of Rome was to the southern Mediterranean island of Lampedusa on July 8th. Lampedusa is, in Europe, it's kind of famous now because it is the primary point of arrival for impoverished African and Middle Eastern migrants seeking to enter Europe. Uh, what they do is they, they make their way, usually because they've been trafficked, uh, they, they make their way to either Tunisia or Libya, and then they get on these rickety boats and try to cross the, the Mediterranean. The estimate is over the last decade, some 20,000 people have died trying to make that crossing. Uh, if they survive, they're then warehoused in detention centers in Lampedusa and elsewhere throughout Europe. On July 8th, Francis went to Lampedusa to lay a wreath in the sea to commemorate those who have died. He spent hours listening to the stories of people who are currently warehoused in these detention centers on Lampedusa. Uh, and then he gave a speech in which he condemned what he described as the globalization of indifference to impoverished migrants. And by the way, it was a powerfully prophetic gesture because you know what happened two weeks later? What happened two weeks later is that a boatload of 500 refugees from Eritrea who were trying to make it to Lampedusa, capsized off the shore, 340 of them died. Okay, so only about 160 of them survived. Uh, and, and of course the irony is the 160 who survived are currently facing criminal charges in Italy because there's a, a law that makes illegal entry into the country a criminal offense. Uh, and so Francis's appearance that day uh, and what he has said subsequently uh, amounts to one of the more powerful sort of pro-immigrant statements uh, that we have seen from a religious leader in recent memory. All right, that was Lampedusa. The visit to the favela on July 24th. You probably know that the trip, uh, the papal trip to Brazil was actually uh, originally planned for Benedict the 16th. Okay, so Francis kind of in inherited an itinerary. He made two changes to it. One is he asked to add a day stop at the shrine of uh, Our Lady of Aparecida, 
uh, in, which is about 70 miles or so uh, away from Rio. Uh, Our Lady of Aparecida is the national patron uh, of Brazil. Uh, Francis has a powerful belief in, in popular Latin American devotion, and so it was very important to him to, to go there. The other uh, change to the schedule he made is that he wanted to visit a favela, which is the word in Portuguese that, that in Brazil they use to describe the slums, that is, the places where the poorest of the poor live. The particular slum he wanted to visit was a place called Virginia, uh, which is in Rio known as the Gaza Strip of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, because it's been the site of bloody clashes between rival drug gangs and also between the police and the security forces in the gangs. A year ago, city officials in Brazil sent in a foul mix of armored personnel carriers and tanks to try to wipe the gangs out. And then on, on the back of that, after they laid waste to the place, uh, they claimed that they had brought peace, okay, that the place had been pacified. So on that particular day, Francis stood there in, uh, on a soccer field uh, in this salon. By the way, the, the weather was god awful. I mean, it had been raining all night, it had been raining the, all that day, and so it was, a, it was a muddy, miserable day. But Francis stood there in the open air, and he said two things. One, he said, no campaign of pacification will ever succeed. Peace will never be brought simply by smothering the symptoms of poverty. Peace can only be created by addressing the root reality of poverty, by addressing the reality that too many people in this society are marginalized and abandoned and forgotten. If you want peace, that is the only strategy, which was a, a, a direct kind of, uh, if you like, sort of defiance uh, to the claim of the political class in Brazil that the problem in Virginia had been solved. The other thing he said, standing on this platform, addressing the poorest of the poor, is that the church is with you. So I come here today to deliver this message. The church is with you. And what he meant by that is not merely that in a kind of abstract way, we support your struggles for, for justice and all that. But what he meant is we are going to be here. We are going to be in this favela. We're going to be physically present to you. We're going to share your lives with you. And whatever your experiences are going forward, you will never have to ask, where is the Catholic Church? Because the Catholic Church is going to be here. Now, I'm telling you, that message resonated powerfully with the, the, the poorest of the poor who were in Virginia that day. Uh, I was there in the press pool, and there was a guy who came up to me who uh, uh, started talking to me, you know, after he heard the Pope's speech, started talking to me in this rapid-fire fashion, speaking whatever the kind of indigenous dialect. I had no idea what the guy was saying. But uh, he obviously wanted to get a, he knew I was a Western reporter, so he wanted to get a message across. Okay? <clears throat> and so when that wasn't working, he then tried to shift to Portuguese. But his Portuguese, probably slightly better than mine, but not that much better. Uh, and so we weren't really communicating. And so then we shifted to this portion, what, what happens when two people who don't share a common language are trying to communicate, you know, what you do is, of course, you go to hand gestures, right? That's the next stage. So he started doing, making a big circle, and it was clear what he meant is he was talking about the salon, okay, the place that he lived, and he gave it a thumbs down, okay? I got that, okay? Then he was pointing to where the Pope was standing, and he gave him a thumbs up, okay? And I got that, too. So what I'm telling you is the Vox Pop among the poorest of the poor in Brazil that day was slum bad, Pope good, okay? Uh, and that message certainly came through loud and clear. All right, then uh, the Pope's intervention on Syria. As you know, not so long ago, the major Western powers, including the United States, were on the brink of going to war in Syria. Uh, we were talking about launching military strikes in Syria as a form of retribution for the alleged use of chemical weapons by the Assad regime. Pope Francis basically mobilized a full court diplomatic press against that idea. Uh, he called in all of the ambassadors who were accredited to, to the Holy See to give them a kind of briefing uh, against the idea of using force in Syria. Uh, he used all the tools in his toolbox to send out anti-war messages, including, by the way, his Twitter account. Uh, and, uh, of course, he called a global day of prayer and fasting for all the Catholics in the world on September 7th, uh, including presiding himself over an incredibly moving and an evocative penitential service in St. Peter's Square, a five-hour service uh, on the 7th of September. 
uh, where he was physically present the entire time and gave an incredibly moving reflection uh, about the futility uh, of trying to solve these kinds of problems through armed uh, intervention. Uh, and although I, I, I certainly wouldn't say that Pope Francis is the lone reason why the conflict, why we did not, in fact, at least to date, go to war in Syria, I think that's part of the equation. I will tell you that every diplomat in Rome uh, paid very, very careful attention to what Francis was saying about Syria because they know his approval ratings. They know his cachet in the global media. I mean, most diplomats will tell you that Francis is the new Nelson Mandela or he's the new Dalai Lama. I mean, that is the, one of these kind of secular saints who, if that figure issues moral disapproval of some policy of their government, their government is going to pay attention. Uh, so I do think that that intervention on behalf of the Pope cut some teeth, okay? Uh, so what we have basically is a pro-immigrant statement on the 8th of July, a statement of solidarity with the poor on the 24th of July, and an anti-war statement on the 7th of September. Those are by far the most high profile political interventions of this Pope. Uh, and I think they speak to his commitment to trying to lift up the social gospel of the Catholic Church and, and enshrine it in a position of rough equality with the pro-life positions of the Catholic Church, which he certainly owns and supports and will defend, but which I believe, he believes, uh, have gotten more attention th than the rest of the Church's social gospel. All right, finally, mercy as the core spiritual message of this pope. Mercy. A guy by the name of Enzo Bianchi, who is a, a monk, a founder of an ecumenical monastery called Bose in Italy, world famous, recently did a statistical analysis of all of the words Pope Francis has used since his election on March 13th. And what he found is that by far, the term that Francis has used the most is mercy. Mercy. Pope Francis' first Sunday Mass was on March 17th. And instead of celebrating it in St. Peter's Basilica, he went to the, the parish church in the Vatican, St. Anne's Church, to say a Mass there. And in his homily, he kind of unveiled a program of governance, the core idea of which is, the strongest message of the Lord is mercy. Mercy. On May 26th, when he made his first visit to a Roman parish, and of course, popes typically go around and, and visit as many of the parishes in Rome as they can, because they are, after all, the Bishop of Rome. So his first was to the Roman parish of Saints Elizabeth and Zechariah, on, on, out on the periphery, the, that is in the, and of course, as you probably know in Rome, European cities are kind of the opposite of American cities, in that in European cities, the rich live in the city center and the poor live in the suburbs. So he went out to a working class suburb, working class parish, May 26th. Uh, I actually interviewed the pastor uh, at that parish after the Pope uh, went there. Uh, he's actually a Romanian by the name of Father Beoni Ambris. Uh, in, in, in the parish, they call him Padre Ben. Anyway, Francis was supposed to show up at 10 o'clock in the morning. Okay? At 9.15, Padre Ben hears the rotor wash of a helicopter in the sky. And he's thinking it's the Carabinieri, right? The Italian security who are supposed to be there to protect the Pope. But instead, it turns out it's actually the Pope's helicopter. So Francis lands 45 minutes early, pops out of the helicopter. Father Ben goes out, okay, puts out a cigarette, goes out, uh, you know, to, to say hello to the Pope. Uh, and the Pope says, look, I'm sorry for the early start, but here's the thing. Uh, in addition to saying mass and meeting the parishioners, what I'd like to do while I'm here is I want to hear some confessions. Now this was not part of the program. So Father Ben basically grabs eight people at random, okay, uh, and says, you're going to confession. <laughs> and it's so cute. He said, they, they said to him afterwards, uh, they said to him at the time, uh, well, Father, that, that's very nice, but we're actually here to see the Pope. To which Father Ben said, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Uh, and so he brought them into, confession, into the confessionals, and you know, one by one, Francis sat uh, and, and heard their confessions, uh, and then administered forgiveness to them. Now, why did he do that? Well, I mean, at one level, he takes seriously being the Bishop of Rome, and I think he sees this just as part of the standard sort of pastoral service that a local bishop ought to perform. But deep, more deeply than that, I think he wanted the world to see the Pope making a priority 
out of administering the church's premier right of mercy. Mercy, ladies and gentlemen, is his papal motto. Okay, it comes from the Venerable Bede, and it's a kind of complicated Latin formula, but it means basically choosing through the eyes of mercy. Okay. Look, I will tell you this. I have covered three popes, and my experience is that each pope, although they, they have all been John Paul II, Benedict XVI, and now Francis, they have all been very complex men, but each one of them tends to have a kind of signature soundbite, a signature phrase that cuts to the heart of what they're about. With John Paul II, there is no debate over what his signature phrase was. His signature phrase was, be not afraid. Okay? This, this kind of call to the church to recover its missionary confidence and swagger, you know, after a period of kind of introspection and self-doubt. Again, with Benedict, there's no mystery about what that signature phrase was. For Benedict, the signature phrase was reason and faith. His proposition to the postmodern world is that reason and faith need one another, that faith shorn of reason becomes fundamentalism and extremism, that reason shorn of faith becomes skepticism and nihilism, that to be healthy, you know, these two attributes of what it means to be human need one another. Okay. Well, similarly with Francis, we're only eight months in, but I will tell you it is already crystal, crystal clear what that signature phrase of this pope is. It's something he has repeated so often that it is basically a mantra. I mean, they ought to have it printed on, on bumper stickers and slap them on all the Vatican limos. Okay? And that line is, the Lord never tires of forgiving. The Lord never tires of forgiving. This is the pope of mercy. The pope of mercy. I have interviewed a number of Jesuits who studied under Jorge Mario Bergoglio back in the 70s and 80s, and what they will all tell you, there's one in particular who said, what you, to understand Bergoglio, what you need to understand is this, that Bergoglio is capable of forgiving in you what you cannot forgive in yourself. Okay. That anyone who hits rock bottom will find shelter in Bergoglio. It was true in the 70s and it remains true today as Pope. Now listen, a minister of the Christian gospel obviously is obligated to pronounce both God's judgment and God's mercy on a fallen world. Okay, both of those elements are absolutely indispensable to the proclamation of the gospel. But I think Bergoglio's calculation, Pope Francis's calculation, is that the world has heard our judgment very clearly, that now what the world needs to hear is our mercy. So I think absolutely everything he's doing, from the nitty-gritty details of how do we restructure the Vatican Bank, up to what do we do about divorced and remarried Catholics and beyond, I think every decision he is making is premised beyond everything else. Fundamentally, it's premised on the desire to make the Catholic Church strike the world as a community of mercy a community in which we don't simply pay lip service to mercy, but in which we actually practice it uh, in the way we relate to one another and the way we relate to the broken and wounded people of the postmodern world. So the Pope of Mercy. All right. A couple quick words about uh, concern that has been expressed about some of what we've seen from Francis. Despite what I said earlier about the rave reviews that Francis is drawing, uh, there are some important sectors of opinion, both inside and outside the church, uh, where there is some ambivalence or some concern. Uh, I actually wrote a column recently in which I talked about Pope Francis's older son problem. Okay? And this is a reference to the parable of the prodigal son. Okay? Francis has done a marvelous job reaching out to the prodigal daughters and sons of the postmodern world, but I think there are some older sons in the church people who believe that they have been loyal Catholics who have been carrying water for the church for a long time who are feeling a little left out okay, by some of what they're seeing. And I think we could identify at least five uh, of these older sons. Uh, first, I think there are some pro-life Catholics who worry that the Pope's dialing down the rhetoric uh, on things like abortion and gay marriage and contraception amounts to a kind of unilateral disarmament in the culture wars. Second, uh, I think there are some doctrinal purists who worry, theologians, who worry that Francis's kind of freewheeling shoot from the hip style risks confusion 
on some key matters of doctrine, sin, salvation, and so on. Uh, third, I think there are some liturgical traditionalists who worry that this pope does not foster the same sense of, uh, of sobriety and, and even awe for the liturgy that they would associate with Benedict XVI. Fourth, I think there are some political conservatives who would be concerned that this talk about the social gospel risks shading off into a kind of uncritical embrace of the political agenda of the secular left uh, in, on, on things that have nothing to do with matters of faith. Uh, and then fifth, I think there are some church personnel, and particularly people in the Vatican, who are just quite frankly a little tired of listening to the new boss take pot shots at them. You know, I mean, describing them as careerists, as being infected with the leprosy of a royal court, uh, uh, you know, uh, as uh, being excessively Vatican-centric, uh, and so on. So, I mean, we do have these older sons out there, and I think the, the two things that, that we can take to the bank about all of that one, uh, Jorge Mario Bergoglio is an extraordinarily politically savvy guy. Uh, I think he is well aware of that reaction uh, and will do what he can to, to try to bring those folks along. Secondly, Pope Francis is someone who is profoundly committed to unity in the church. Uh, if you want proof of that, read the address he gave at his general audience on the 25th of September. It is entirely devoted to the theme of unity in the church. You probably know uh, that he is going to be canonizing both John Paul II and John XXIII next April, right? It's actually April 27th, Divine Mercy Sunday. And putting those two popes together is in itself a statement about unity in the church. But there's a bit of wisdom that comes from John XXIII that I think Pope Francis is, is, is going to assimilate. John XXIII, amid the ferment of the Second Vatican Council, was once asked how he understood his role. Okay, and his answer was, I have to be Pope both with those with their foot in the gas and for those with their foot in the brake. Okay, that's what it means to be Pope. Right? Well, I think Francis understands that as well. Uh, and so I think he's going to try to bring that forward uh, in, in terms of trying to um, bring people along with him. But my final thought is this. I think in that effort to sort of bring people along, uh, and make sure that, uh, that we take advantage of the remarkable opportunity that Francis is, pre is presenting us. What I would like to say is I think all of us can help the new Holy Father out. If we do what we can to kind of foster a spirit of unity in the church, and particularly unity around where the new Pope is taking us. And of course the truth of it is we're not always really good at that, are we? I mean, if, if we take an honest, clear-eyed look at ourselves, I think we would have to admit uh, that those of us uh, in church circles often have a peculiar genius for creating points of division where they don't necessarily need to exist, right? There's a joke, I don't know if you've heard it, but have you all heard the one about the dad who heard a ruckus in his backyard? Church joke? It goes like this. There's a dad sitting in his living room. And he hears a, a, a kind of, you know, a, a noise out in the backyard. So he gets up from the couch and he walks outside. And he sees all of the kids are sitting around on folding chairs in a circle and they're just screaming their lungs out at each other. Okay, so you're an idiot, you know, and you're completely wrong and I can prove it, et cetera, et cetera. And so the dad walks out and says, what is going on here? And one of the kids looks up at him and says, oh, don't worry about it, dad, we're just playing church. Okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the thought I want to leave you with is that if we can resist the temptation to play church with Pope Francis, uh, that is, if those who are most enthusiastic about the new pope can resist the temptation to use his words and deeds as clubs to beat up on other people in the church they don't like, okay. and if those who are most ambivalent about the new pope can resist the temptation of a rushed judgment and instead wait to see how this plays out before drawing conclusions about where it's going to go, then I think perhaps we will be positioned to take advantage of the absolutely unique and totally unforeseen teaching moment that the papacy of Francis presents us with. Because whether you find yourself at the end of the spectrum of the most enthused or you find yourself at the end of the spectrum the most concerned, the one thing empirically none of us can deny about this pope is that he is a global sensation. And therefore we have, from an evangelical point of view, a missionary point of view, 
we have in Pope Francis the opportunity to reintroduce Catholicism in a positive key to an often jaded and sec you know, uh, secular world that, that in many respects tuned us out a long time ago. All of a sudden, they are paying attention once again. My suggestion to you would be that the thing to do uh, is to try to take advantage of that in, in the most unified fashion we possibly can, rather than allowing this teaching moment, this opportunity to be squandered in the kind of internal tribal warfare we sometimes get sucked into that unfortunately does not represent us at our best. Okay? So uh, with that, let me say thank you. Thank you for your attention here tonight. Thank you for all that you were doing. Uh, and uh, well, God bless you. God bless Salve Regina University and Vive El Papa. I think John is very happy to take questions, so maybe I can call on people from here and John can take it. And questions. while you're pondering, let me give you both an invitation and a warning. Okay? Invitation is you are welcome to ask anything about the presentation you just heard, but don't feel restricted to that. If there's something else that you think needs to be put on the table or some other bit of burning curiosity you have, I mean, this is your portion of the conversation, not mine, so don't feel like you have to defer to me to set the agenda. All right, that's the invitation. The warning is, Tony and the good people at Salve Regina University are paying me to stand here for the next 20 minutes or so, whether you ask questions or not. <laughs> so if you don't ask questions, I am simply going to tell you additional Pope jokes. Okay? And I promise you, this is not a consummation devoutly to be wished. Example, Pope walks into a bar with a frog on his shoulder. Okay? Bartender looks up and says, hey, that's kind of cool. Where did you get that? And the frog says, Buenos Aires. <laughs> I got a million of them, but um, but um. All right, what questions do you have? Uh, in the interview in America Magazine, the Pope spoke very movingly about <coughs> uh, a woman who had had an abortion at, uh, in the war, <coughs> remarried, five children, and was trying to live a Christian life and talks about uh, going to the confessor, but it's sort of, he sort of left it in limbo of sorts. And uh, what will he be doing about you know, people who are trying to lead very Christian lives and they're not really uh, too welcome? Okay, so the question is, in the, the Holy Father's interview with Jesuit publications, which, by the way, only in the United States is this referred to as the interview with America Magazine. This was actually an interview with Chavilla Tacatolica, which America reprinted. Okay? Uh, but in any event, uh, in that interview with the Jesuit publications, he talked about a woman who had had an abortion and then repented and come back to the church, but in the meantime had been divorced and remarried and so was sort of struggling in her faith journey. But, but sort of didn't sort of bring that to conclusion. So the question is, you know, what is this pope going to do for people who are kind of broken and hurting and in various, you know, not necessarily exactly where the church thinks they ought to be? Right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, listen, um, I, I think, again, remember what I said. I, I think in the, the, the point of departure about thinking about Francis's approach to these questions is the pope of mercy. I think the first thing he wants to express is a message of mercy to people, meaning that, these, that, that he understands that all of us, in various respects, are not exactly where the church or where God thinks we ought to be. We are all at various points in the, in the faith journey. Uh, and whatever our external circumstances may be, the internal reality of our souls are that we are all struggling to realize, to become the men and women that God wants us to be. Uh, and that the, the fundamental message of the church wants to express to that is a message of mercy. So that's the point of departure. On the specific question of divorced and remarried Catholics, I, I think it is very clear that Francis has signaled that he wants a more generous disposition for these folks. I mean, under the current rules, if you are divorced and remarried without having obtained an annulment, you're not supposed to go to the sacraments, and in particular, you're not supposed to receive communion. Francis said on that plane flight from Rio to, to Rome, 
uh, that he wanted to take a second look at that, and in particular, he was interested at whether or not the Catholic Church might take a page from the Orthodox on this point, where the Orthodox don't uh, bless a second marriage, but they allow a second marriage, and they allow people who are in a second marriage to receive the sacraments. The, the Orthodox view of the sacraments, you know, the Catholic view of the sacraments is that we see these as symbols of communion. So we require a communion in the faith because to us it, it falsifies the sacrament if you receive the sacrament, but you're, but you're not in full communion of faith with us. Okay. The Orthodox perspective is that sacraments are medicine for the sick soul. It is precisely people who are in broken and imperfect circumstances who in a way most need the medicinal, medicinal value, the, the, the grace that the sacraments provide. Uh, so Francis indicated that he was open to that. Uh, of course, as you probably know, he has called a synod of bishops for next October, the 9th through the 24th of October, on marriage and specifically to take a look at divorced and remarried Catholics. I think all of us are expecting that on the back of that synod that there will probably be a papal decision, uh, at least as a kind of R&D, to allow dioceses around the world to begin bringing those folks uh, into sacramental communion, uh, perhaps not en masse, but allow, you know, empowering bishops to empower pastors to make prudential judgments in individual cases, that that can be done. Um, so, but, but look, I mean, you know, your question was, he, he didn't exactly bring that line of thought to conclusion. I mean, you're right. I mean, listen, I, I think he wants a more generous policy for the divorced and remarried, okay? Uh, I think he wants people who have had abortions, but who have gone through confession as a result of that, uh, and who are again, I think he wants them to feel welcome in the church. But I think there are a lot of areas where Francis has very self-consciously sort of kick-started a conversation without prejudging where that conversation is going to go. I mean, for example, another thing he said in the plane flight, which he repeated in his Jesuit interview, is that he wants a deeper theology of women. What exactly does that mean? I mean, I, I'm not sure I could tell you, and I, I'm not sure he knows. I mean, Bergoglio is not a theologian. Bergoglio is a pastor and he's an administrator. That's what he's done his entire life. I don't think he necessarily has an end game in mind for where the, I think what he has is a pastoral instinct which says, we need to think more deeply about the role women play in our community of faith. And he wants to sort of inspire theologians and others to sort of pick that up and run with it. I don't think he necessarily has a prefabricated model in his mind of what the end of that is going to be. Over here. I think what you're saying is he's being led by the Holy Spirit. And I think also that um, Mother Teresa laid the footwork for this. The poverty, the humbleness, the coming out there as a, a poor human being working with the poorest of the poor. The one thing I felt that you left out was his love. His love comes through so much to me. I can't even believe the love he has for everyone, and especially the, the atheist in that interview. His love for him was beyond belief. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, earlier I talked about the continuum from enthusiasm to concern about the Pope. Here we have an enthusiast. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so your point is, I, I didn't talk about the Pope's, you know, palpable love for people. Well, I mean, I kind of thought that, that it came through much of what I was saying. But, but, but let, me, two, let me pick up on two points he made. Uh, first, um, his, interview for the, his interview with the atheist, who is a, a colleague of mine, a guy by the name of Eugenio Scalfari. One of the cute footnotes to that is that um, Scalfari, who is, uh, just turned 90 yesterday, by the way, um, Scafari uh, had written a column about Pope Francis saying, here are some questions I would love to be able to ask the Pope. Okay? So Pope Francis then writes a letter to Scafari answering his questions, which were published in the Italian newspaper uh, La Repubblica. And then in the back of that, Scafari is just walking down the street one day and his cell phone goes off and it's Pope Francis on the other end saying, why don't you come by and see me? I've actually written about Francis as the cold call pope, because he has this habit of just calling up complete strangers <laughs> and saying, well, let's have a chat. You know? uh, so he called up Scal So Scalfari comes in. They have this like two-hour conversation in the Casa Santa Marta. Scalfari did not take notes. He did not record the conversation. But then he goes back to his office at La Repubblica and sort of reconstructs it, okay? which then is you know, published uh, as his interview uh, with the pope. And the truth of it is, on some points of detail, he kind of screwed things up, 
Okay, I mean, for example, there's a point where Scalfari has the Pope saying that after he was elected, but before he accepted the papacy, he, was, he has Francis saying he was so overwhelmed that he got up and left the Sistine Chapel, okay, and went out to his, what Scalfari describes as a small room next to the balcony. Now, the truth is, this, this obviously proves to you that Eugenio Scalfari has never been in the Vatican because there is no small room next to the balcony. I mean, I've been there many times. It just doesn't exist. But that's what Scalfari, you know, had him doing. Uh, and, uh, and only then coming back in and accepting the papacy, which, you know, and then the Vatican had to clarify that that didn't actually happen. Um, and I, I, one, of the, one of the cardinals, you know, the Pope has created this group of eight cardinals to advise him on stuff. So one of these eight cardinals, I was with him at dinner in Rome, okay, and this thing of Scalfari came up. And uh, this cardinal told me, well, he had gone to Francis on that point, right, about this mistake in the interview. And he said to Francis, so what's up? We all know that didn't happen. And Francis said to him, well, look, okay, it, it, was, it was a little imaginative. Okay? But he said, you know, Scalfari is an old guy. We have to be nice to it. <laughs> now think about a 76-year-old pope saying this is an old guy, right? <laughs> we got to be nice to him. But that's his humanity coming through. I mean, basically, Francis is a big picture guy. I mean, his takeaway was, okay, Scalfari screwed up some of the details. But I mean, the big picture in this interview was what I said, and so I'm not going to sweat that stuff. Uh, the other thing I want to mention, you, you know, you talked about the Holy Spirit. Look, I mean, I'm a journalist, uh, you know, not a theologian, so I, I deal in the realm of the observable. But I will say this. One of the mysteries about Pope Francis, and I think this may well be the definitional mystery about Pope Francis. Back to that trip I took to Argentina in April. I went to Argentina assuming that everything we were seeing from Francis as Pope would be very familiar to Argentinians. Right? And so it would just be a matter of like taking what had happened in Argentina and then kind of dialing it up and applying it to the, to the papal stage. Well, what I heard was that's not at all the case. What Argentinians will tell you, yes, they knew that Bergoglio was a humble man of the poor. Yes, they knew he was a very competent CEO. But the kind of charisma and palpable love that you described that he projects in public, they will say that is a complete novel. I mean, what they'll tell you. Do you know, he was, he was Archbishop of Buenos Aires for 15 years. Do you know how many interviews he did during those 15 years? Five. He's already done three as Pope, okay, and he's only been Pope eight months. People will tell you that he shunned the spotlight like the plague. I mean, he would turn down nine out of ten invitations he had to appear in public. And when he had to do it, people who covered religious stuff in Argentina, my colleagues will tell you, he came off as stiff and boring and gray. Okay. So the question, I mean, his own sister, I interviewed his sister, Maria Elena, okay, who lives about an hour outside Buenos Aires in this humble little home that has become a kind of informal pilgrimage stop, okay, for everybody who wants to, like, connect to the new pope. She told me she does not recognize the man who is pope now, <laughs> okay. I, she says all that stuff was in him before, but he never let it out before, okay. So the question, therefore, becomes, how do you explain that, right? All right, here's the thing. What we know is that Pope Francis, when he, after he was elected and after he accepted, after he left the Sistine Chapel, he was walking down the Alla della Benedizione in the Vatican to go out onto the balcony, you know, to, to, to greet the world. People who watched him will tell you that he, when he was walking down that hallway, his eyes were down, he was obviously uh, anxious. Okay, it was, it was as if he was carrying the weight of the world on his shoulders, okay? Before he stepped onto the balcony, he veered into the Pauline Chapel to have a moment of prayer. And something happened to him in that moment. I mean, he has, he has subsequently said that something happened to him in that moment. Uh, and when he came out, of course, we know from the moment he came out of the balcony, he was a changed man. I mean, I have a cardinal friend, not an American, by the way, so don't, please don't start guessing about who this is, okay? It's, it's not Tim Dolan or Don World. It's none of, no name you would know, but a, a cardinal from Latin America who has known Bergoglio for decades, who told me that a couple weeks ago he had a private meeting with Bergoglio, uh, with Pope Francis in Rome. And he went into that meeting and he said to him directly, you're not the guy I knew from Buenos Aires. You're a different guy. And Francis said to him, after I was elected, I had that moment of prayer in the Pauline Chapel, and a sense of interior peace and freedom came over me that has never left me. 
So there was, listen, I'm not one of these guys that, you know, I'm, not, I, I'm, I'm sort of spiritually tone deaf. I don't look for mystical experiences under every rock, okay? But I'm telling you that there was something, some brush with the divine that happened to this man that freed up some part of him that was, was there, you know, before, potentially, but, but has now been liberated. And listen, let me tell you, again, as somebody who's covered a lot of popes, you dare not underestimate the importance of the mystical dimension in understanding the psychology of a pope, because whatever else these guys are, they are, at core, true Christian believers, okay, who believe in the power of prayer, who believe in the power of the divine, who believe themselves to be part of salvation history. I mean, with John Paul II, you, you, you probably remember, right, that, it, that in the twilight of the John Paul years, there was a lot of speculation about whether John Paul would ever resign, right? And of course he didn't. I mean, Benedict ended up doing it, but John Paul never did, right? But you remember that there was a lot of conversation about whether he would quit? I knew from the get-go that John Paul was never going to resign, and here's why. Because he was profoundly convinced that on May 13th, 1981, the Virgin Mary changed the flight path of a bullet to preserve him in office. Okay, the assassination attempt against him occurred on May 13, 1981. That's the feast day of Our Lady of Fatima. Okay? And if you look at where Mohammed Meli Atka uh, was standing in St. Peter's Square, you look at where he fired that pistol. That bullet, you trace the trajectory, it should have ended up square in the Pope's heart, but it didn't. It ended up six inches to the left in his ribcage. And on the first anniversary of the assassination attempt, John Paul went to Fatima to put the bullet that had been removed from his ribcage in the crown of the Virgin at Fatima to thank her for her intercession. Now, if that is your worldview, okay, if you believe that the Virgin Mary has suspended the laws of physics to keep your papacy going, I don't think you ever get out of bed one morning and say, you know what, I've had enough. <laughs> right? Right? So, I mean, I think a pope's spiritual convictions and his mystical experience have to be factored in in understanding, you know, where the pope is going. And, and similarly with Francis, he had that experience. On the evening, the early evening of March 13th in the Pauline Chapel, some, something happened to him, some transformation came over him that filled him with this sense of, of being freed, being liberated, being able to be more himself than he had ever been at any previous point in his life. And I think his willingness to kind of let it all hang loose, you know, so to speak, on the global stage, I think, comes out of that. It's not just communication strategy, okay? And it's not even a kind of vision of ecclesiastical leadership, but I think it's a reading of providence, you know, that, that has led him to, to that capacity. Yes? What I'm finding interesting right now is you're saying that people who knew him before, you know, when he was uh, in Argentina, they really don't recognize that same personality. So the Cardinals, in essence, did not elect him for who he appears to be now. Okay, this is a fascinating question. Uh, and so the question is, did the Cardinals who elected Bergoglio knew what they were getting? And are they experiencing buyer's remorse? <clears throat> Here's what I would tell you. I've, I've talked to, uh, I think my last count was I probably talked to 35 of the 114 who voted in that conclave. So take this for what it's worth. I mean, I, you know, I, I can't pretend to, to infallibility on this question. Um, but, but the cardinals that I know, uh, what they will tell me uh, is that there were some aspects of what they have seen from Francis over his first eight months that are absolutely what they were voting for uh, and other aspects that have been a surprise. Okay? So the things, in, two in each column, okay? The two things they knew they were getting, first of all, they knew they were electing a man of the poor and a man of the social gospel. That was his profile in Buenos Aires. Everybody knew that. You know, when I, when I was in, uh, again, back to my time in Buenos Aires, I went to one of the, what the, the, the Argentinians call their slums the vicious miserias, the villas of mystery, of misery, villas of misery. Uh, and I went to one of the more infamous vicious miserias uh, in Buenos Aires, uh, where, which is where the parish of the Virgin of Cacupe is located. The Virgin of Cacupe is the national patroness of uh, Paraguay, because most of the people who live in this particular slum are, are poor immigrants in Paraguay. 
Uh, and, uh, I, and it's one of the places that, uh, that Bergoglio was associated with. Okay? So I'm interviewing the pastor there, a guy by the name of Juan Isis Mendy, a young guy who was groomed by Bergoglio to, to serve in the slums. Uh, and so I asked him, look, okay, this whole thing about Bergoglio being the bishop of the slums, okay, is that rhetoric or is it real? Okay? I mean, just tell me, because, I mean, it's, you know, even, even if it's just rhetoric, it's attractive rhetoric, but I mean, I, I want to know how much reality is there to it, right? And he said to me, you know what? Don't take my word for it. Just go out in the street and stop people and ask them, you know, what their perceptions of Bergoglio are. Just, you know, at random. So I took my translator, and we left the, the pastor in the parish office, and we walked out into the streets uh, of this slum, and I stopped about seven or eight people at random and said, what can you tell me about the new pope? Do you know what they all did? I mean, before they even said anything verbally, every one of them, what they did is they ran back into these like tin shacks or wood shacks that they lived in, and they came back out with these like tattered prized photos that they had of Bergoglio baptizing their kids or confirming their nephews or sitting in their living room when their husband died holding their hand and consoling them. I mean, they, from their point of view, Bergoglio was one of them. Okay, from their point of view, from the point of view of the people in this parish, the election of Francis was not an Argentinian pope. It was the pope of the slums. That's how they think of it. Okay? So, I mean, they, and they, that, that profile was clear. So the cardinals who voted for him knew that and they embraced that. Okay? Now, secondly, they also knew he was an extremely adept manager. Okay? Now, let's bear in mind, this was by far the most anti-establishment conclave of the last probably 100 years. I mean, I think you'd probably have to go back to 1922 to find the last time that the cardinals understood themselves so clearly to be voting for change. Now, in this case, they weren't voting against the teaching legacy of Benedict's papacy. I mean, I think they all revered that, but they were voting against the business management that they associated with the last eight years. I mean, you know, the Holocaust-denying bishop scandal and the, the Vatican leak scandal. You all remember that, which, which ended in the arrest of the Pope's buller? I mean, a team of Hollywood screenwriters working around the clock could not script something more, you know, surreal uh, than that. Uh, and on and on and on. All of the other kind of breakdowns in, in just making the trains run on time, okay, that they associated with the last eight years. So they wanted somebody who could get the Vatican under control. Frankly, many of these guys, and I can tell you this from personal experience, many of these cardinals are just sick to death of reading the latest story about a scandal in the Vatican Bank or about perceptions of palace intrigue in the Vatican, because the truth of it is, when bombs go off in Rome, they are the guys who have to pick up the pieces in their own diocese, right? I mean, they're, they're, you know, they're walking down the street of Sydney or Paris or Manila, and you know, reporters start calling them for reaction to the latest thing from Rome, where you know, a Monsignore who used to work for APSA has been arrested for being involved in a $26 million cash smuggling scheme Right? They're, just, they're sick of all of that, uh, and, and they wanted somebody who would clean the place up. Bergoglio, of course, has been in church leadership his entire life. He was, he was the provincial superior of the Jesuits in Argentina at the age of 36. I mean, he's, he's been carrying administrative responsibility his, his entire life, but he's a complete Vatican outsider. So their thought was, this is somebody who knows how to make the trains run on time, but he's not tainted with association, you know, with, with, with this mess. Uh, and so. And in that sense, he, and, and he has revealed himself to be a very adept administrator. Okay, so that was no surprise. Now, the two elements that were surprises uh, when you talk to cardinals, one, I think many of them have been surprised by how much of a, a moderate Francis actually is. Uh, because the, 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 the take on him uh, as a Jesuit from Argentina was that in the 70s, there was a falling out among the Jesuits in, our, of our, uh, in Argentina over what loosely you would call liberation theology, uh, and that Bergoglio, the perception was, had been on the conservative side of that, you know, th that debate. Uh, and so most thought of him as a fairly conventional conservative, uh, most cardinals, that is. Uh, and you know, what has become clear, and, and Bergoglio addresses this at great, to, at great length in that Jesuit interview, uh, is that while he was never any, you know, uh, he, he was never part of the liberation theology crowd, he was also never part of the opposition to it. Uh, and fundamentally, what he sees himself as is a kind of non-ideological centrist. 
Okay, so I, I think that has been a surprise. Uh, pleasant for some, and, and maybe not so pleasant for others, but a surprise. Uh, and then the other surprise, and here I can quote Cardinal Timothy Dolan of New York, uh, one of the guys I've asked this question to. I said to him, you know, Tim, uh, have you been, uh, is what you've seen from Francis what you expected or not? And here was his answer. His answer was, look, we knew we were getting the humble man of the poor, and we knew we were getting a good CEO. What we didn't know is that we were electing a rock star. <laughs> uh, I think it is that charismatic, because again, that was not, back to my, my answer to this lady, that was not Bergoglio's profile in Argentina. You know, he, he was not somebody who sort of set the world on fire with his smile, you know, uh, in Buenos Aires. Uh, so they were not really expecting that uh, from him, uh, and, and, and he surpassed their expectations. But I don't think, on that point, I don't think you can fault the College of Cardinals, because he surpassed everyone's, his own relatives' expectations. Yes. Uh, on this point. Debating yeah. in Rome what to call them. Uh, some argue for the G8, uh, some argue for the C8, uh, and some actually argue for the V8. <laughs> now to me that's too evocative of tomato juice, but that may be a very American reaction. But, but in any event, there's this body of eight cardinals the Pope has created. The question is, how did he pick those particular guys? Uh, well, fundamentally, you have to know that the decision to create that council came out of the general congregations of meetings of cardinals before the conclave. Because the way the conclave works is things don't start when they file under the Sistine Chapel. They come to Rome several days in advance, and every day they gather in something called a general congregation. Uh, and one of the things the cardinals agreed, agreed upon during that general congregation is that the pope needed some other vehicle to hear the voice of local churches around the world. Okay? So on the back of that, Bergoglio decided that he would create this new council, and he was going to appoint guys who came from different parts of the world. Okay, so I mean, these guys represent every continent on earth. Okay, uh, of the eight, there's only one Vatican guy. That's Cardinal Bertello, who's the pro, you know the governor, uh, the governor of the city state, and even Bertello has been a diplomat before, so he served all over the world. But the other seven uh, are, don't live in Rome. Right? So you've got the Cardinal of Tegucigalpa in Honduras, you've got the former Cardinal of Santiago in Chile, Cardinal of Boston, Cardinal of Sydney in Australia, uh, Cardinal of Mumbai in India, and so on. Okay, so they represent different parts of the world. Uh, and I think the, the, so that was the first thing, that he wanted, he wanted somebody, he wanted people on this council who represented bishops' opinions in different parts of the world. Secondly, he wanted people that he knew and trusted. Uh, and that's another hallmark of Bergoglio. If you look at the people he's appointing, okay, not just to this council, but for example, the people he's given top Vatican jobs to, they all are former Vatican diplomats who have served at some point in their lives in Latin America. Why? Well, because Bergoglio knows them and therefore can make an intelligent judgment about the qualities that they bring to the job, right? Um, so these eight cardinals are all people who were in his wheelhouse, people he knows, people he's had experience of, people he believes in. Uh, and third, I think it is also the case that these eight cardinals don't all think alike. Uh, and I think that's characteristic of, of Francis as well, that he doesn't, he doesn't want yes men. He wants, he wants people who are going to give him strong opinions and not necessarily always the same opinions. I mean, you look at that G8. Actually, I think if you took the College of Cardinals as it exists right now, Okay, and you wanted to identify the left wing of the College of Cardinals, probably one of the people you would put there would be Oscar Rodriguez from Tegucigalpa in Honduras. Okay, and if you wanted to identify the right wing of the College of Cardinals, one of the people you would put at the very end of that spectrum would be George Pill from Sydney, Australia. They're both on this council, right? And I think that's indicative that, that, that Francis wants, you know, both geographically and ideologically, he wants to hear a variety of different points of view. By the way, one other thought, since you all live in the Northeast, let me tell you this, there is no question at all that the go-to bishop in the United States under this pope is Cardinal Sean O'Malley of Boston. Okay, not only because he was named a member of the G8, but functionally speaking, he was the alternative to Bergoglio in this conclave. Okay? I mean, I will tell you for a fact, and I don't just mean in terms of popular Roman opinion, although that's true. I mean, if, listen, I mean, if, if this were like the fifth century when we still elected popes by acclamation, I'm telling you, Sean O'Malley would never have come home, okay, because the Romans would have had him on the throne of Peter 
you know, in a heartbeat, uh, because he looks like Padre Pio, okay? And then so when, when they look at Sean O'Malley, that's what they see and that's what they think, okay? Uh, but inside the conclave itself, all of the qualities that led that conclave eventually to, well, not eventually, fairly quickly, actually, to embrace Jorge Mario Bergoglio, there were also qualities that led people to think very seriously about Sean O'Malley, and Bergoglio is very well aware of that. Um, and so as somebody who takes seriously the sentiment of his brother cardinals, he knows that Sean O'Malley is somebody that his brother cardinals thought could do this job. Uh, and so I'm telling you that as, as things go forward, there will be no figure on the American Catholic landscape more central uh, in terms of kind of shaping the Pope's thinking about the United States than Sean O'Malley. Yes, ma'am, in the back. If I'm what? I'm sorry, I missed. If you're teaching a course on the papacy anytime soon, can you tell us where and when? Isn't that what we're doing tonight? I mean, <laughs> what more do you want? Yeah, okay, so the name and the Jesuit thing. I know we need to wrap this up. Uh, first of all, on the name, you know, uh, of course, I was on CNN, you know, narrating uh, all of this when it happened. And I remember uh, when, the, after the, when the Habemus Papam happened, right, when they made the announcement of the new pope and the name by which he was going to be known. I mean, first of all, here's a little dirty little secret of the CNN thing. If, if you were watching any of that and you noticed that I seemed a little confused, let me explain what was going on. Two seconds before, the, before Tehran stepped out to do the Habemus Papam, a producer came in my ear and said, John, are you going to be able to understand the Latin? And I said, yeah, as long as I've got the audio, uh, we'll be okay. That minute the audio vanished. Okay. So when Tehran stepped out to say who the Pope was, I could see his lips moving, but I had no earthly idea of what the guy was saying. Thank God for them. there was a Mexican TV crew behind us that started screaming Bergoglio, because otherwise I would have had no idea uh, what was going on. But anyway, you know, the question was, was I surprised by the election of Bergoglio? What I said is, the election of Bergoglio is surprising but not stunning. Okay. I mean, most of us who were doing this handicapping had him on the B or C list. You know, we didn't have him among the front runners, but we had him in the mix because he'd been a serious candidate last time, you know, in, in, in 2005. Uh, I would say the, the election of a pope from Latin America is not surprising. I mean, two-thirds of the 1.2 billion Catholics in the world today live outside the West. By mid-century, it's going to be three-quarters. I mean, it was inevitable that a pope from the developing world would be elected at some point. So again, I mean, it's, it's certainly striking that it's finally happened, but it's hardly a stunner. Okay? Even the Jesuit thing, I mean, I didn't, again, I would say maybe surprising but not stunning. I mean, the Jesuits are the largest and most storied religious order in the Catholic Church. It was probably inevitable at some point they were going to give the church a pope. So I didn't find that. The only thing I found truly stunning, this is what I said on air, and it's the only thing from that whole period I'm proud of, the only thing I found truly stunning was the choice of Francis as the Pope's name. Because the thing is, I've interviewed experts on the papacy over the years who had you know, argued until they were blue in the face that no Pope could ever take that name. I mean, the argument always was there are three, th three names that no Pope can ever take. You can never have a Pope Jesus, you can never have a Pope Peter, other than the first, and you can never have Pope Francis, because these are three irreplaceable, singular figures in Catholic life, and that it would be quasi-blasphemous for a Pope to take that name. So it was stunning just in the boldness of the, of the choice. The other thing that was stunning about it is that it was a whole program of governance in a word. Right? Because think about it. I mean, you know, there are a lot of names popes could take that don't necessarily automatically at the grassroots create expectations. Right? Uh, you know, I mean, if, uh, if, if, if he had decided to be Pope Clement or Pope Leo or whatever, I mean, we wouldn't, you know, at the, at the grassroots, most of us would not automatically leap to assumptions about what he was trying to say to us by choosing that name. But Francis... I mean, Francis is the one iconic name in Catholic life that automatically summons an entire vision of church to us, right? I mean, the, the, the love affair with Lady Poverty and, you know, Brother Sun and Sister Moon and all of that. 
I mean, so by, 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 by choosing that name, I mean, he took upon himself a set of expectations about what kind of pope he was going to be that were, I think, quite dramatic. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and of course, I mean, what we've seen since, I mean, that, you know, that, that famous uh, talk he gave on the 16th of March, three days after his election, when he explained his choice of name, and he gave us that famous soundbite where he said, you know, what I dream of is a poor church for the poor. I mean, that's in logical <coughs> continuity with the choice of name, right? But if he were not delivering at all, what I'm saying is that that name would be a crushing burden if he were not perceived to be delivering on it. Right? In a way that almost any other name you can imagine that he would have taken wouldn't be. Okay? So it was, I, I think, quite stunning. The Jesuit thing. Um, here's a comedic thing, uh, I think, about the Jesuit reaction to this pope. Most of my, I know a lot of Jesuits, uh, and uh, most of my liberal Jesuit friends, uh, in the 24 hours after Bergoglio was elected, they were all like trying to throw cold water on the whole thing. Right? They were saying, oh, you've got to be careful, because you know, back in the 70s, he was on the wrong side of the whole liberation theology thing. Uh, and we're not really sure. What the, and they were like worried that he was going to complete the crackdown on the Jesuits that started with John Paul II and all of that. Uh, and then you know, they sort of watch what's happening. And like within about a week, these guys were all, you know, not only were they in the enthusiast crowd, they were trying to position themselves as the authorized interpreters and exegetes <laughs> right, of what Francis is about. You know, uh, look, I, I, what I would say, and I don't think, by the way, I don't think Francis is going to create a Jesuit mafia around him. I don't think you have to worry about that. But I do think that the Jesuit imprint on him is significant in two regards. One, I think his leadership style very much tracks with the, the leadership style that you develop in the Society of Jesus. That is, if you're a provincial in the Society of Jesus, or if you're the general of the order, you are expected to consult widely and listen carefully to all your counselors, but at the end of the day, you make the decision. Okay? They don't put it up for a vote. You know? That famous line from The Mission, right? If you've seen the movie The Mission, where Jeremy Irons says, brother, this is an order, not a democracy. You know? Well, they, they foster that uh, in the Jesuits. Uh, and I think Bergoglio's leadership style very much reflects that imprint. He listens widely, he consults widely, and I don't just mean like widely for a pope, but I mean like widely in general. I mean, he, he consults a staggering range of people uh, about things. Uh, but then he very much makes decisions himself. He plays his cards very close to the vest. I mean, if you've noticed, there have been very few leaks out of Rome over the last eight months about what the pope is going to do, right? I mean, we generally, we learn of decisions that have been made once they've been announced. We don't learn about them in advance. And that's because with John Paul, there were people around him who were involved in many of these decisions. So the circle of people who knew what was going to happen was larger. With Benedict, there were people around him who knew what was going to happen. Bergoglio is the CEO himself. Okay? Uh, so I think that reflects the Jesuit imprint. And I think the other thing about the, the, the Jesuit imprint is you, you probably know that one of the things, in addition to the Lord never tires of forgiving, another soundbite that we associate with, with Bergoglio, both from Argentina and as Pope, uh, is this business that a, the, the church has to get out of the sacristy and into the street. Right? This notion that if the church spends too much time in the sacristy, breathing the stale air there, it gets sick. That to be healthy, it has to be out in the street where ordinary people live. Uh, and he, he gave that a kind of more refined formulation in that Jesuit interview, and we talked about the imperative of the church to seek out the existential peripheries, you know, the, the existential borders uh, of the postmodern world and position itself there. That's always, in a way, how the Society of Jesus has understood its charism, right? And so I, I think that comes out of his Jesuit formation as well. So I think the Jesuit imprint is profound. Uh, but on the other hand, I don't think you necessarily have to have done the scholastic with the Society of Jesus to have a word to say about this pope. Is that it? I think, I think we're a little bit over time. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Let me say one last thing before they turn off my microphone. Uh, which is uh, that I want to, I, I want this to be the beginning of a conversation among us rather than the end. That is, I don't just want to parachute out of here and have no further contact with you. So let me say this. If, if I can ever be of help to anyone in this room, 
Uh, and I have no earthly idea what that might be, but uh, you know, if you're a student and you're in a graduate seminar and some pope question comes up, or you know, you're in an adult faith formation program in a parish someplace and there's some Vatican rumor that is metastasizing and you want to do some rumor control, or I mean, for God's sakes, people, if you're coming to Rome and you want restaurant recommendations, <laughs> okay? And this is where I really shine, whatever it would be. Uh, okay, if I can be of help to you, I'd be delighted to do that. I have an online column uh, that is called All Things Catholic. Uh, if you just Google or Bing or, you know, whatever, uh, All Things Catholic, John Allen, you'll find it. My email address is at the bottom of that. Uh, and I do respond to that, although if you're going to contact me that way, please do put Salve Regina or something in the subject line. So I don't think you're the ninth Nigerian prince today who's going to give me 30 million bucks if I just give you my bank account information. Uh, but, you know, assuming you permeate my spam filter, uh, if I can be of help to you, I'd be delighted to do that. I mean, I, you know, I, I run around, you know, talking a great game about the need to uh, foster unity in the church. But obviously, if I actually mean that, I need to walk my own talk. So if I can be of service to you, it would not be an imposition. It would be a chance for me to feel like a person of integrity. So take advantage of that. Thank you. God bless you. God bless Salva and Regina. Viva il Papa!